Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this panel is multi-stakeholder responses to deepfakes and synthetic media. Uh, we really do have an all-star cast here, uh, several of which I have the pleasure of working with almost daily. So this is amazing. And these really are some of the experts who are thinking through all the different dimensions and stakeholders that generative AI, deepfakes, synthetic, synthetic media all touch on. So I will have the panel uh, introduce themselves and we will hear some opening comments from everybody and then we'll have a lively discussion. We welcome questions as well uh, afterwards. So I will first pass it off to Claire. Applied it to that some, and then I'll lie to our boy average for certain needs and titles and then we'll yeah, create in comments. Okay. Hi everyone. Can everyone hear? I've heard the acoustics are mixed and I'm loud. So maybe that will be a benefit for once. Uh, I'm Claire Leibowitz. I lead the AI and Media Integrity Program at the Partnership on AI, uh, which is a global multi-stakeholder nonprofit devoted to responsible AI. Uh, and because Laura included her dual affiliation, I'm also a doctoral candidate at the Oxford Internet Institute, so local, part-time. So thank you. Um, so my name is Laura Herman. Um, my primary affiliation um, is that I lead AI research at Adobe. Um, and as part of that role, I lead research for the Content Authenticity Initiative, which some of you may have heard about. I'm excited to talk more about that today. And I'm also a DeepL student at the Oxford Internet Institute. Hi, I'm Bruce McCormick. I don't go to Oxford. Um, I am, uh, I wear a couple of hats. I am the chair of something called Project Origin, which is a, a project we got brought together the New York Times, the BBC, CBC Radio Canada, to talk about the impact of generative AI on news. Oh, and Microsoft, sorry, I forgot about them. Uh, we've been working along with the Content Authenticity Initiative, put together yet another organization called the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity. We're very good at naming things. Um, that that is an organization that's been working on standards for media provenance, which was uh, something kicked off at the PAI and is something that's multi multi stakeholder and collaborative. Hello, all that Justin. Uh, so I'm Josh, uh, founder CEO of Iris or Iris XYZ and Mini Shill. Um, I seem to be the only person who's not friends with anyone on this on this panel. It's just okay. I can uh, find fire my own corner, but um, I actually come from the perhaps shadowy world of Web three crypto blockchain. Uh, I say shadowy as a joke because people seem to have a stigma around it, but we, uh, I guess when it comes to what, what we really focus on, we're focused on scaling blockchain-based permanent storage and things that relate to providing transparent provenance technologies as well. So how do we create this kind of permanent provenance record of, of content? That's fundamentally kind of one of the core problems we work on. We work with a bunch of different uh, companies, mostly within the world of Web3, but specifically in, in the world of AI. We work with some ZK, zero knowledge machine learning companies. Uh, we work with some decentralized AI compute companies as well. Uh, so kind of a bunch of different, a uh, bunch of different areas, but hopefully I can provide a slightly different kind of perspective here. It will my kill. So I'll ask everybody to take maybe three, four minutes, five minutes, and uh, I'd love to hear everyone's own perspectives on the different stakeholders that we really need to think through when we talk about generative AI and synthetic media and some of the considerations uh, that we are all considering, considerations that we're considering uh, uh, with that in regard. So let's, we'll go down the line. We'll start with Claire. Thanks, Manir. So I'll start actually with an anecdote that is illustrative of some of the challenges I think about and then describe a bit more about how we have PAI, which is has multi-stakeholder in our DNA, think about the current moment in synthetic media. So two weeks ago or a few weeks ago, I was on a plane and I was watching a documentary about the presidential portraits in the U.S. of Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. And um, I'll try and describe them, but um, one was by Kahindu Wiley, who's a black artist who is known for these kind of floral borders around images of black political fig figures who are kind of depicted like European masters. And he had some comment at the beginning that pictures can lead to progress, but oftentimes it, it takes a while for the world to catch up to them, which I think is a testament to a lot of the work that we do. 
And being that I do the work that I do, I went on to Dolly, OpenAI's image generator, and put a prompt in that said, uh, portrait of a presidential figure in the style of Kahindu Wiley. And it spit out these uh, kind of uncanny, but images with floral borders per his typical style and black figures wearing kind of military garb. So clearly I, as an individual relying upon open AI system, could emulate this artistic figure and even then go on to TikTok or Instagram and share that picture. So there's this whole pipeline of actors who are involved. But there are also decisions being made about how we create that content. So when I changed my prompt and wrote a portrait of Barack Obama in the style of Kahindu Wiley, I got an error, a refusal from OpenAI telling me that I can't search for that. A testament to the fact that there are clear decisions being made about the types of synthetic or generative content that we can share. So I, I, I give this example to kind of show that there are very intentional decisions being made about what's possible in synthetic imagery. And to share a bit more about how PAI has been involved in that work, we were founded, our origin story, I think, is a testament to the moment we're in in generative AI. We were founded in 2016 by the heads of AI research at some of the largest technology companies. So Facebook, Apple, Amazon, DeepMind, IBM, Microsoft, and Google to be a venue that would work not only with technology, but with a cast of characters from other prongs of industry. So like Adobe, media and journalism, some startups also, and, and to think about these issues that transcend any one institution in their scope and impact. Because even in that example I showed you, there's questions around creativity, expression, safety, misinformation, and all these topics that are not just the ones and zeros of computer science. And for the past five years, we've been doing a few things around this topic of AI-generated content. One, we convene groups of people, so uh, that's how I've been lucky to get to know some on this mini stage. But in that convening, there's an aspiration to put out guidance derived from that set of actors. So we've been thinking about this question of how do you navigate dual use, that there is enormous opportunity for creative expression, but at the same time there's misinformation and harm potential from the technology. And I think in our DNA is this sense that while the values need to be articulated from a collective, that we need to work globally and we need lots of different perspectives brought to bear on these big questions around something like generative media, the way you actually enact those values in different steps of this pipeline, so let's say you're an open AI building models, but you're also uh, trying to think about generative AI from the perspective of Bumble, for example, who's concerned with people imitating other people through images on their platform, we need to be really intentional about how we operationalize those values in different stages of this pipeline. So I'll close by stating we, in February, launched after several years of collective attention and participatory policymaking a framework. You can check it out at syntheticmedia.partnership on AI org and in essence it's a technology policy that delineates how those building synthetic media how those creating and how those distributing it which implicates both media institutions and large technology platforms can actually think about transparency disclosure I'll tee Laura and and Bruce up for thinking about what it actually will mean to navigate um, this moment we're in related to generative media so we'll talk about that a bit more but I'll pass it along to Laura. Awesome, thanks Claire, very interesting as always. Um, so the team that I'm on at Adobe is actually within the design organization. And so we're actually a design research team by name, which means that we foreground the people that are using the technology first and foremost. So I'll talk about a different group of stakeholders, and I think Claire was talking about these more institutional stakeholders, which are of course very important. I'm taking a little bit more of a human-centered perspective. So specifically at the Content Authenticity Initiative within Adobe, um, we think about three different groups of people that we need to design and build for. And that is creators, consumers, and implementers. 
So the creators are Adobe's sort of bread and butter. We know them very well. These are the people using um, a lot of our creative tools like Photoshop and Illustrator, um, but also anyone that is trying to create content um, and, and then distribute it out in the world. The consumers, um, pretty self-evidently, are the consumers of that content. They're the receiving end of what's being put out in the world. And then the implementers, interestingly, are those platforms that are distributing that content. So that could be something like the BBC or the New York Times it's as a media platform, or say TikTok or um, X now uh, as a social media platform. And so my team has had the chance to do a lot of really interesting research speaking to these different types of potential users or current users of the tool. And as you can imagine, they have very different needs when it comes to um, content provenance disclosures, which is what um, the Content Authenticity Initiative and C2PA more broadly is focused on. So um, there's been a lot of really interesting moments where we've needed to really dig into the user research to figure out exactly what we should prioritize from the product and design perspective based on the needs of these different audiences. So um, as one example, um, recently we were doing some research into how content credentials are integrated into Photoshop. Now, from the perspective of a consumer, they might say, I want to know how an image is edited in every way when it comes to me on, on Instagram. But from the point of view of a creator, you can imagine that there are also some privacy concerns when you're bringing up all of the edits that they've made to an image, where they made those edits, who made them, where and when. And also the creators brought up to us a very interesting point, which is that their creation is also multi-stakeholder. So there's not just one single creator. That was a sort of assumption that we needed to, to break down. It's a, it's a creator team that we need to think about. And different creators in the team have different levels of ownership or interest in um, the distribution of the creative work. Um, and as you can imagine with generative AI, this has all become all the more relevant. So um, I should have told Claire to use uh, Adobe Firefly when she was doing her little exercise. But uh, we have Adobe Firefly, a generative AI tool. And, and we've decided that um, for all the creators using Adobe Firefly, they will automatically have our sort of content credentials, which provide information about where and how a piece of content has been made, which of course we'll talk more about. Um, in the piece of content generated with Adobe Firefly, so that whenever that piece of, uh, piece of content travels onto different platforms, wherever it goes, it has that information in it. So we wanted to make sure that was visible to consumers of content, putting them sort of first at the forefront of the consumption of generative AI, because we know so many consumers are worried about what they're seeing and what they can trust, um, while also making sure that it's very clear to creators that they're making this decision and therefore this disclosure might be available on platform that they distribute this content on. Of course, implementers are also a big focus, but I think uh, Claire sort of touched on that a little bit. You can imagine that different implementers, whether they are a news media platform or a um, advertising agency or a uh, social media platform have very different needs in terms of what sort of provenance disclosures they might want to put on their platform. So we've been also doing a lot of research into how we can um, provide sort of a dynamic set of credentials that meet those different stakeholders' needs. So. Lots of multi-stakeholder considerations, um, so a great prompt for us to think about. Pass it to Bruce. Thank you. Uh, last, month, uh, last March, uh, the picture of the Pope in a puffy coat got everybody's attention. That's sort of the seminal moment that everybody woke up. Um, and, and about four or five years before that, uh, my role was at CBC Radio Canada, which is the public broadcaster in Canada, and I was there to think about technology and how is it going to either enable or threaten our core businesses, and one of them is news. Uh, and I ran into a video of the Pope um, in Washington, D.C., at the Cathedral in D.C., a CNN video, uh, where the Pope basically walks up to the sacrament and then pulls the tablecloth out from underneath it and takes a bow. Um, clearly artificially made, but what caught our eye was it was fully CNN branded. And then we started thinking about, okay, not only what happens if somebody fakes the content, what happens if somebody fakes us? Um, you know, our sets are all, and most broadcasters, sets are all robotic cameras. We use the same camera angles every night. We use the same hosts every night. That's a lot of data that gets out there that can be sampled and can be start to be, create synthetic things. And we started saying, what if our hosts on our sets were doing something that wasn't our news? And what if that got pushed out? And we went, oh, that'd be really bad. Because trust in news was already becoming a big issue. If, if, if our brand image and all the work we do to maintain trust is used to amplify misinformation, we're culpable. 
So we started thinking about that about four or five years ago. I was at CBC Roger Canada. I had some conversations with my colleagues at the BBC and the New York Times, and we went, yeah, this is a problem. Uh, then we went into, we, we started where everybody goes, let's get into detection. How are we going to detect this? And I'm sure most of you guys have worked through this already. Detection isn't going to work. So we went, okay, that's a problem. So if you, if you can't handle detection, you have to flip it and you get to provenance very quickly. And when we went to provenance, we said, great, it's, 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 it's doable technology. It, it, you know, it's, it's, it's basically taking banking level security and dropping it on top of news is the way we started to describe it which is good and is, it's work, but it's doable work, and we knew we could get to the end of it, except we had to align the entire universe around that. We had to get every media company to start thinking about it. We had to go down the entire technical stack. We had to get all our vendors that, were, that make software for us start to do that. We had to get camera manufacturers to start to do that. And we go, okay, that's gonna be a fun set of conversations to try and organize. Um, except we were at the partnership at AI, and we looked around and half of those people were in the room. Uh, and we said, okay, we got to start some quick coffee conversations, right? So we went wandering around and had some coffee conversations because over, over the course of dinner, the, the three of us had said, you know, if we're waiting for somebody else, who are we waiting for? We better take action. Uh, we're going to have to reinvent the internet. Hmm, okay, that's going to be a challenge. And then we run into Eric Horvitz, the chief scientific officer of Microsoft over coffee, and he goes, I can help with that, right? So, okay, that's, that, that's somebody, right? Then, then, then we reached out, we ran into the folks with Adobe and saw what they were doing. When we were looking at videos, they were looking at stills, and we said, we can do that. So, slowly, a, a community has built up uh, around the Co Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity that said, we have an approach. It's, it was, we worked from an approach, to getting the team in a room and saying, let's get some of our engineers together. We wrote a spec, we, we got something worked out, and now we're in the evangelism position where you see a lot of us, we, we have brand new pins that say CR, which is our new little logo, which, which we've come up with. But, but that's the stage we're at. We could not have done this alone. This problem is a, the, the problem of misinformation is a tragedy of the commons where it's easy to throw noise and destroy things, it's hard to maintain trust, and the only approach to a tragedy of the commons is a community response. So we have been activating the community. Uh, Claire's been fabulous as a resource to try and bring us together and hold, us, hold the conversations, but the community of media companies, engineering companies, technology companies, uh, IP companies are coming together to, to respond to that, and that's, that's been, a, it's been a wonderful experience over the last couple of years. Um, I think the one thing you can take from one of those answers is something, is a point that I was going to make later, but uh, the biggest blocker with all of this is social consensus. And w whenever you think about new technologies, you'll, you'll start to realize that they all go through similar kind of, kind of stories and, and phases in their lifetime. Um, and I think if you look back at history, most of human existence is spent on consensus and coming to an agreement. Uh, and I think that's, that, that's obviously kind of what a lot of time is spent on when it comes to these initiatives. Um, I guess if you didn't do that, then you'd have um, the likes of you know, Google owning the HTTP standard and, and things like that, which already happened today. But um, anyway, I guess jumping into, jumping into kind of my side of things. Um, so again, we're, we're very kind of Web3 focused. Um, but we still do some kind of traditional kind of work, work with the traditional companies as well. Um, and we really look at it as a stack, um, kind of bo bottom up, and that really means like from the, the hardware itself. Um, so how do you do kind of credentialing at the hardware level? Um, we don't do this ourselves, but this is kind of an obvious part, obvious part of the solution there. And then you, you kind of work your way up. So we see kind of hardware at the bottom and then uh, software, kind of I guess application level software at the top. Uh, which essentially is kind of yeah pr protecting all sides all sides of the all sides of the marketplace, um, and I think the, the the side that we come from in the world of Web three is actually uh, ties into a lot of the provenance things around I, I guess the main thing is cryptography, so one of the biggest advancements that uh, the world of blockchain has produced in the last two years love or hate the whole kind of vertical as, as a whole has produced some of the biggest advan advancements in cryptography as of late especially in the world of zero knowledge so if you're talking about um, you know, cr uh, how do you prove that some uh, content was edited from another piece of content uh, without sharing what the edits actually were, where well, you can do that doing z uh, zero knowledge proofs. We're probably like 10 years away from this being particularly scalable, but the point is, is that um, me kind of advocating in the world of, of Web3, it's really about uh, all this kind of fringe research, um, which enables a lot of these kind of different solutions to these, to these problems. And then you can have, you know, all these great entities to our right kind of 
doing the, the, the hard kind of social consensus work while we sit back and, and do a lot more of the, the kind of the research side. And we're obviously very grateful for the work that, that is being done there as well. Um, so that's at least kind of the, the perspective that I come from. Um, and I guess some of the main problems that are being solved in the world of Web3, I'd say um, you know, blockchains fundamentally provide a, a provenance record, uh, one that is decentralized that anyone can fundamentally trust because it's not controlled by a single party. Uh, and I think actually the most interesting thing coming from Web3 is actually not a startup, but think identity protocols. I think um, the idea of proof of personhood is the biggest thing. So uh, one of the, the big components to a lot of these solutions will be, OK, you have this identity, but how do you know this identity you know, isn't, is actually tied to one person? How do you make sure one person doesn't have you know, 10 different identities? And how do you map that as well? Um, so these are all kind of core problems which are, are, are being, you know, trying to be solved in the world of, of Web3 right now. And these are all kind of the, the companies that I guess at Iris we, we work with as well, but gives you a picture of some of the problems that we're kind of all focused on. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think we have close to 30 or 20 minutes uh, for questions. Um, I'm going to kick us off with a couple of questions, the power of being the moderator. Uh, but I definitely want to get some audience questions in as well. Um, so I've heard a lot of similar themes from different, stake, uh, from different perspectives here. Uh, there's a variety of forums represented. Uh, Trupic is actually proud partners of the CAI, of the C2PA, and of course, PAI. So we get to see a little bit of this. My first question for, for all of you is, given that there are multi-stakeholders, right? There's, everyone has a stake in digital content today. Governments, technologists, businesses, people, consumers, et cetera. How, but they all have different incentives. How do you get the incentives to align on transparency, authenticity in the digital content. How do we solve that problem, particularly when there are, let's say, business models that don't necessarily align for those same incentives? Who wants to take that one on first? Great question. Um, it, I'll, I'll answer by saying I don't think they have to align. Um, the differences that people bring to the table are actually part of the strengths. So uh, I, I talk about it as being a multi-sided dice. So we all are, are focused on this dice, but depending on the, the, the orientation you bring into the meeting, you may have a different set of things you need to deliver. So Adobe's dealing with the creative communities. That's great. Um, we're dealing with the news community. I don't have to worry about what's going on with the news community, the creative community, because I know you've got that covered. Um, you know, we, what we have to find is where's the intersection set and, and find out ways where you can say, okay, you need to do something over here for your community and it doesn't affect me so I can relax my constraints a little bit and let you solve your problem and then later on we can work it the, the other way around and, and expand the this size of the dice or the size of the common area, right? So, so, so Constant conversation helps you find areas that make the dice bigger, but everybody still stays to their own facet and, and, and stays to work there. Because if we all become the same company and all start to agree on everything, then it get, gets very boring, right? Uh, it's, it's the differences that come to the table that really strengthen the solutions and, and give us a stronger, a stronger co community. Cool. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll answer it very practically. I think right now um, we're dealing with a lot of situations where, like I was saying, maybe the consumer wants something different from the creator or even different types of creator need different things. Um, and so as a researcher, my answer is always the way we solve this problem is through research. Uh, so that is my answer. But I think um, what's been really interesting is that um, one of the researchers on my team has recently run this like multi, sort of, the, I like this multi-sided dice idea, this multi-sided um, study where we've talked to creators and consumers in these different um, types of media. So news media being one of them, but also thinking about like influencer content, thinking about more traditional creative content, 
and asking them basically what matters to them in this context. And then we were able to map out all of that data and basically make a huge grid of like, what are the things that keep coming up over and over again? And what are the highest priorities across the board? So we can optimize for, for making sure that those, um, in our case, assertions are visible to everyone. But then also thinking about that multi-sided dice, how can we create um, designs or affordances that are dynamic? So we can read in information, okay, we know that this person is a creator in, in this context, here's what we're gonna surface to them in that case, right? So that we create actually a solution that is in self, itself dynamic and responding to those multi-stakeholders in real time. Um, so that's very much from like a design and technical perspective how we're thinking about it. Um, but Claire, I think, I'm sure you have a perspective from institutional yeah. lens. So I guess from six years of multi-stakeholder work or cat herding, um, I have a few observations. So there's this strange fusion of needing to both honor people's individuality and to be very cognizant that the BBC or CBC have these differences from Adobe, but at the same time, it, it will sound cheesy, but there's, at least as a neutral third party, there is this kind of rhetorical device around that this is a huge societal problem. Uh, that if you turn on the news, even if you don't work at the BBC this week, you see how confirmation bias or uncertainty about uh, where sources come from is just something that breaks down large societal societal values like democracy or public discourse. And there's a major utility that may sound naive, but also is really important to kind of um, coalescing around that bigger picture. But at the same time, as I articulated earlier, there's this need to say, we understand we all care about democracy. We all care about the public interest. And at the same time, we know that you as a company may have regulatory pressure or a bottom line. So in that framework I described, uh, we launched with uh, a microcosm of the field, I would argue. It was the CBC, the BBC, OpenAI, Adobe, TikTok, three synthetic media startups, and then Bumble and Witness, a video and human rights nonprofit. And people ask us all the time, how did you get all of them to agree to something? One answer is you can read our document and say it's a total least common denominator and all it says is do no harm. I like to think it does a lot more than that. And one of the ways we were able to do that is one is bringing everyone along. I think there's some, uh, again, a lot of this sounds cheesy, but beauty in having people co-create governance in the AI realm. And also, our document is actually organized around our own version of stakeholder communities. There's explicit guidance for the institutions building models for synthetic media. There's explicit guidance for creators, and there's explicit guidance for distributors. And that solves the problem of, you know, we understand that you as OpenAI may have different pressures or even technical realities than a distributor. And by recognizing both their individuality and kind of this collective responsibility, I think there's a really powerful synergy. I also think as kind of a someone who has to be a catalyst for these conversations, there is a certain degree of humility that I think is helpful for approaching them and also um, awareness of that this is a socio-technical challenge and you can't, you know, one version of expertise is not gonna solve the problem and that by bridging those worlds, you can move forward. I will add something in it. We haven't spent actually much time addressing what the problem we're even trying to solve for is here. Um, and I wanna state that Part of the reason I think we've been able to push forward is a recognition of both the power of AI-generated media for doing and all the things I've described earlier, both affording enormous creative expression, but also casting doubt on entire narratives through fake material that if you're copying the BBC, that's not a great world. But you'll notice if you study our document, there's uh, we're not just talking about AI-generated material. There's an awareness that we're nervous about the power of AI for misinformation and harm, but at the same time, we're very aware that some of the puffer pope was not as problematic as many other examples of mis and disinformation that do not make use of AI techniques. So I say this as a catalyst for multi-stakeholder conversation because I think being very attentive to the broader problem you're trying to solve and not being kind of 
captive to, oh, we're just fixated on AI. No, we're fixated on manipulated narratives and upholding the truth and maintaining our ability to speak truth to power and depict war crimes, et cetera. Then it moves us away from just kind of the technical realities of the world we live in and brings us all together, but also makes our guidance better, I would argue, at the same time. I don't know if you have thoughts or Munir. So I'll take advantage of the mic being on this side, but Josh, <laughs> I want to start with you on the, on the next question as well, and, and feel free to chime in from the last one. There's one major stakeholder that I would love everyone's perspective on, and that's government. There's a lot of opinions on what government can and cannot do with regard to generative AI, putting uh, parameters, guardrails on it, off it. Also on the Web3 crypto side, which somewhat uh, interrelated there, what is government's role how can they be most helpful? And is it possible that they could actually be harmful? So let's start with Josh and move this way. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> if you speak to the average person in Web3, we're all generally against governments being involved with things, mostly because, um, or I guess governments over-regulating. Uh, regulation should really just protect consumers, but you usually find that a lot of regulation usually either one hinders uh, innovation, or two, uh, means that only kind of the big players can innovate. Um, so it's typically kind of one or the other. Um, so uh, this is actually kind of one of my uh, major concerns with a lot of these standards. One of the questions I was going to ask is, you have these very central bodies driving a lot of these standards, uh, which is good. Like You always need to have at least like responsibility and kind of the amount of work that people put in is pretty distributed. So if you look at the CEI, I'm assuming Adobe probably does like over 50% of the work actually driving a lot of these standards. Or let's say a, a few of the, the few of the kind of few of the, let's say the 10, 20, 30, how many, however many people in the initiative, only a few of them are doing the majority of the work. And that's not me dissing anyone else. That's just simple. Um, that's just how the world works. And but the issue there is that um, this you know, regulation can come in. Who controls who the uh, trusted authorities are. So one of the, the key things around the, uh, the CI st uh, standard, for example, is that the trust really comes down to do you trust the entity who is um, creating these credentials? Um, and it, in, in the world of Web3, this is known as a proof of authority um, consensus. So it's basically you have a trusted list of people. They say, OK, these people run this system. Uh, and that's basically what this is here, um, which is good and bad. It's good because you know the average consumer frankly, can trust Adobe, can trust a lot of these hardware providers. But on a long enough time horizon, um, a lot of these entities, uh, on, sorry, I would argue on an infinite time horizon, uh, every single proof of authority system that's ever existed has become malicious in some form. Um, and that's obviously where decentralization Web3 has come in as well. But typically, a lot of this maliciousness does involve the government, involves regulation, which usually leads to some form of monopolization. Uh, and not to make this over political, this is just kind of the reality of you know, the tech market now. There are only a few companies that own the tech market now. So it's things we've seen before. How do we stop something that is societally kind of could break the fabric of society? How do we stop uh, the solution to that being monopolized by a few, a few entities? And sorry, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm attacking Adobe here. I'm actually interested, to, I'm actually interested to, hear, to hear the perspective here. But when it comes to the government, one, they should minimize involvement because we just need to innovate quicker. Innovating slowly, I think, I'm generally against that. Um, it's, yeah, like I, I understand everyone's fear of moving slowly, but um, I think hindering innovation has never worked in the past. And also, I don't think you can hinder innovation. You hinder it here, they'll just, you know, China or another place will just do it quicker. Um, so, Hindering innovation also makes literally no sense unless the, you have the whole globe's consensus, uh, which has never happened in, you know, in the millions of years that, or billions of years that Earth has existed. So those are kind of a few perspectives there. Um, happy to hear some, I guess, different. I actually had some of the same thoughts. Um, the, the issue, one of the issues I've seen with government is just the speed of their ability to absorb new knowledge versus the speed of innovation. Uh, and and, and the education of these people just so that they, they step away from their experience of technology as a user, which is where they mostly see, they mostly see the top of the iceberg and, and where most of the action is going on is below the waterline as we're building infrastructure and building new capabilities that they don't understand because they have not personally experienced it. So, so having that knowledge transfer is, is a challenge. 
Uh, it is a challenge because that knowledge transfer happens at different rates in different geographies. So you've got one set of technologies that are being built for the planet and regulations happening in different zones. So, so that causes a, a challenge. Uh, where government does have a role is to be the proxy for society. And, and to say that this is what is good for us as a collective, and to, to cause that debate to happen. And I think the onus is on us to engage them where they are and help them move forward uh, in, in understanding the stuff that we're doing, because the goals are very common. I mean, we, we are, as Claire said, the thing we all sort of centralized around is we all think democracy is a good idea and we're trying to protect it, and we saw some dangers to it and we're trying to work on it. So, so focus on the common area, engage government as just another stakeholder around our multi-stakeholder process. So yes, uh, agreed with a lot of these points. I will say, um, just specifically in answer to this sort of trusted authority idea, I think it's a really good point to bring up, especially in the context of government being a trusted authority. Um, so we've actually done a lot of research into um, consumers' understanding of the person who's signing the content credential, which is essentially what you're, what you're saying. It's a very complicated term, which is part of the problem, but essentially the person who is sort of writing the, the, the entity, I should say, that's writing the information into the content credential is considered the signer. So you can imagine that signer being Adobe, but that signer could also be Microsoft, for instance, or um, the BBC or Nikon. Um, it's, it's the entity that's like feeding that information in. And so the Content Authenticity Initiative has been really focused on providing sort of SDKs and APIs for other organizations, um, you know, credentialed organizations to become those signers, right, and to take up that role so that there's not, it's not just Adobe as the one sort of powerful authority. Um, but then it's interesting because when you talk to the consumers of content, they're like, what in the world is a signer? And how do I know if I should, like, trust this and they don't realize what a signer means and oftentimes what they're asking for is not only clarity about who the signer is and if they should trust that signer but also just should i trust the thing that's in front of me and i think this goes back to like the problem that all of us are grappling with cai has been very clear that what we're trying to do is provide information to consumers to make trust decisions themselves so it's that like power to the people idea However, when you actually talk to users, they're like, I don't want all this information about all these different things that have happened to this image. Just tell me if I should trust it or not. Like, I just want the fact check. Um, and of course, if you think of the context that many of these people are in scrolling on, say, TikTok, they're not going to stop and like do a detailed content analysis. However, if they're on a news platform, they might take more time to click in. And so that's, again, an, an example of a place where we might have that multi-sided dice where there's more detailed information in a news platform and maybe something more simple in TikTok. But we've been really resisting, in fact, I would say, the idea of making decisions for consumers because we're trying to avoid being in that sort of authority position of we're telling you what to trust or what not to trust because at the end of the day, we don't know what you should or shouldn't trust. That's a decision that the community should make and we're just trying to help provide information that can inform that decision. So I think it's, a, it's, um, it's tricky because the more information we have, the more we want to display to people, but then um, those people tend to be looking for us to synthesize information for them, uh, which then puts even more power on behalf of the, the trusted authority entity, right? So. Um, not a direct answer, I guess, to the government question, but more specifically about how we're thinking about authority in these contexts. I want to reflect on what Josh was saying, which echoed to me the early Facebook motto of move fast and, and break things and the conviction around innovation, which I think we want to innovate, but uh, DJ Patil, who was the uh, a, a chief technologist in the Obama White House, had a revision to that phrase, which aligns with the idea of responsible innovation, which is move purposefully and fix things, which I like because it doesn't eliminate this notion of speed and innovation, but it also implies some skepticism or uh, guardrails as you do innovate. And that's kind of the frame that I think is both tenable and responsible, to use that word again. And we are a nonprofit, so we can't lobby in the US based on our status, but we do interface with government a lot. And I have a few observations on where we are, and that's a huge term, right? What are governments doing? Because not only is there AI-specific legislation in the US, or voluntary commitments, in the US we have White House commitments around AI. Here you have an AI safety summit. 
And at the same time, we have organizations like the Election Commission in the United States who are asking questions about how they think about AI vis-a-vis -vis election spaces. Or we have court cases, and this is US-centric, but that are ostensibly about algorithmic recommendation on social media and what counts as you know, a distributor of content that's active or passive, but that's gonna have huge implications on AI, even though it's ostensibly about kind of an earlier era in technical innovation. Even the Copyright Office, which didn't probably expect to be in the business of AI uh, regulation is. So I like to widen this aperture when we think about government intervention in AI to think about kind of all these agencies that are engaging and all these divisions that are thinking about AI's impact on that space. I also just want to be very blunt and say I do think we need government regulation. The question becomes how and how do we not stifle innovation? And I loved what Laura was talking about. If there are huge trade-off considerations that we run into at the human values level around privacy and security. We want transparency, but we also want privacy. Um, we want to have total openness about how these models work, and at the same time, we don't want bad actors, as determined by who, to use this technology. And these are questions that, you know, you could argue you don't want government to weigh in on, but these are real roadblocks that we are hitting, and the alternative is that large technology companies are gonna make them. Um, and I will comment also on this kind of, you know, people scoff a lot at, you know, Sam Altman's global tour when he talks with governments and, oh, they're claiming they wanna be regulated, BS, you know, they just wanna share. I think there is, I don't think it's all black and white. I think there is some earnest appetite to be regulated because these companies don't really know how to make some of these trade-off decisions. OpenAI, for example, is experimenting with more democratic opportunities for governance. How do we have methods where we talk to publics? There's something called the Collective Intelligence Project. I think a lot of the people who founded that are based here who are asking these questions. How do we make it you know, be more democratic or participatory, how we make these trade-offs and values? So I am interested in government attending to these things. I also want to say some of the, uh, there are some ostensibly interesting solutions that are technically unfeasible and government's inability to grasp that gets in the way. So you'll notice in the White House commitments, if you memorized it, like me, there's one section that's about um, transparency and, and provenance or watermarking. They very, the fifth bullet, thank you, Munir, um, that explains how AI companies should disclose that audiovisual content is AI generated. It has a lot of echoes of our voluntary commitment framework, so we're happy they adopted it from us. But if you were to extrapolate that out to text, for example, which it doesn't include, a lot of those systems break down, both because of technical implementation um, and limitations with those techniques for text. So I say this to suggest that sometimes you can you know, bang your head and say, why isn't government doing more? Because why wouldn't we have disclosure for every type of content, for example. Sometimes they're actually being responsible by saying we don't have the best intervention. At the same time, there's also a lot of this um, kind of, as Bruce was saying, a lack of education in certain technical realities of good governance. So yes, I think we need government intervention. I think it's more interesting at the place of adjudication of values. It should be more democratic than just governments weighing in, because if you're comfortable with one government regulating speech or what is considered free expression, you also have to be comfortable with the next person who gets elected, uh, changing how that functions. And I think a, a general notion that hopefully you've heard reverberating throughout this panel is we need more people involved that we need more perspectives. You're right, it shouldn't be 80% one company dictating the trajectory of all these technologies that are gonna you know, impact all aspects of human life. At the same time, we, need, we want people to say, okay, so how do you do that? What would it mean? The, the solution should be, therefore, we don't regulate. It should be, how do we all coalesce in a more meaningful way around what that regulation looks like? Thank you. Um, I believe we have seven minutes or so for audience questions. So uh, we will try, panelists, if we can keep our answers, uh, uh, yeah, well, 30 seconds or so, so we can get in as many questions. But it is interesting how we were talking about consensus and multi-stakeholders, and even the four people here couldn't come to consensus on government. Imagine what it's like with 100 companies. Uh, but it's really great. That was a lively discussion. Uh, 
moderator, should I be picking, uh, or will would you want to pick uh, questions? So uh, this is the first hand I saw this young lady over here. Yeah, sorry. maybe stand up or. Okay, did everyone hear the question? Yeah. All right, who wants to tackle that one first? Yeah, no, uh, I, I will do my best. Please correct me if I'm wrong. A um, uh, question from uh, uh, someone in government saying, uh, when uh, dis uh, deciding between kind of speed and, and slowing it down and getting government involvement, would it make more sense to slow it down and make sure workers' work, workers' perspectives and rights are considered uh, when we are actually building the standards and this approach to authenticity or generative AI online? So, I'll offer quickly. So first, um, I have a counterpart at my organization that is a whole area of work devoted to AI labor and the economy. So they do work, and I, I love this idea of workers as this kind of monolithic thing. They've done work on the people who actually label and build the data sets that are the fuel for these models that we build. They also think about workers whose jobs might be displaced by, you know, Concept Artists Association. We consulted, for example, artists whose labor might be implicated by the ability to just type a prompt and create create an image. So one, there's this notion of, yes, we need workers involved. The question, though, you're bringing up around how do you do that in a pragmatic way, because someone else in this room could raise their hand and say, what, of the, what about X stakeholder group, where the people who are affected by deepfake abuse should also be part of synthetic media governance. The people who think about fair use and copyright and their text going into that model also need to be thought about. So I'm actually not going to offer some arbitration of how we prioritize, but rather suggest you're right to note that if we consulted every stakeholder group, we'd be still talking and not have any guidance out in the world. At the same time, this notion of who gets prioritized in that conversation is one that I personally don't want OpenAI just deciding, for example. So the worker one, as evidenced, I would hope, by the fact that it's one of five program areas at our institution, is high on that list. So I'll make some normative suggestion that, yes, they should be consulted. But I also want to have some awareness about just the reality that how can you survey the whole world, basically? Because people are all going to be impacted by this. So who gets to arbitrate kind of the, and who even defines kind of the boundaries of these stakeholder groups um, and how we interpret that? A question, not a full answer. I'll just give you two examples to highlight uh, the stuff Claire just talked about. Uh, when we built the C2PA standards, we had a threats and harms group. So, so they looked at threats and harms. But that's an infinite series of discussions, right? So, so it's time bounded, and they came up with some examples of areas we had to be careful about, where we had to make sure we weren't harming free speech, where we had to think about how would this technology be used in hostile regimes. So, so those kind of conversations are going on, but they, they have to go deeper and they have to continue. Um, in terms of the people who are going to be affected, there are the people that do the work, as you said, the people that are building the data sets and do all that kind of stuff, but the, the entire set of society is going to be impacted. Uh, in, in the news industry, hair and makeup people, and if you think I'm a hairdresser, I, how can I possibly be affected by AI? Well, you know, those people get the hosts looking really nice before they do the six o'clock newscasts. We don't need to do that anymore. We can drop the host on in a t-shirt, and we can drop a suit on them, we can put their best makeup on, and we can give them the best hair they've ever had in their life, and do it all artificially. 
Um, you know, so hair and makeup people are going away. The, those kind of things go away. It's going to affect us all. Uh, we have to be a little creative to think about how that effect is going to happen, but we also have to be ready to adapt because this is a pretty significant technology and it, it's going to have impacts. We don't still type on underwood typewriters in the news department. We've adopted technology and we move on. We'll adopt this, we'll move on. Uh, how, where it goes, I'm not sure. Do we have time for one more question? Uh, unless anybody else in the panel wants to address it. Uh, uh, I think the gentleman here, and if we have a second one. Great question. Um, maybe we'll start with Laura and, 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 and then uh, so everyone else can. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say very quickly that I think that is the ultimate challenge. <laughs> I, I don't think there's a perfect solution to that. Um, what we're trying to do is get as many organizations and people who share these values, as Claire was mentioning earlier, together to hopefully be a large enough um, player in the space that we would still be uh, creating the standards. So I think something that um, that we'd like to see is that if, for instance, content credentials, uh, this logo becomes the norm, there's an expectation for that information to be shared, and when it's not, you question it. So even if, you know, Elon or Russia do not share that information, the viewer, by the very nature of not seeing that, start to question, why am I not seeing that? And it brings them along, in a way, into our... Um, sort of value set, right? Because they're starting to question where that information is that they're used to seeing. So this is a way that sort of by, by having large dissemination and by having a large stakeholder group that's all bought into the same values, we might be able to make a difference. But of course, it's, it's a huge challenge. Um, when we talk about transparency, uh, that doesn't take the... Uh, burden away from the person who's receiving the media to make critical judgment and from the pre person who's transmitting the material to say, this is why you should trust me. Uh, the, if the North Korean Department of Propaganda issues authentic North Korean documents, sends them out encrypted with C2PA standards, you will receive, and when you get it, and you can say it really came from North Korea, it hasn't changed since it left North Korea, right? Uh, this is exactly what they sent me. You have authentic North Korean propaganda, right? If, it's up to you to know that you might not want to believe that, right? Uh, so, so, so technology doesn't take away human judgment. Uh, it's just there as a transmission vehicle to get you a little more information to make that information clearer in your own mind so you can make a better decision. So someone said, I, I brought this question up, Grant, in a meeting we were hosting, and the next phase of our meetings is how do we deal with open source questions? You know, the, there's the mischief maker, the bad actor who's not going to use this, and then there's also if this is all open sourced or the interventions are open source, they can be stripped or no one will care. And someone gave this compelling metaphor, which you can feel free to push back on, which was, you know, we all... When we lock our doors in our car, that doesn't prevent someone from smashing the window in, but we still lock our doors, and that hasn't paralyzed us into leaving our car doors open. 
for example. And I thought it was an interesting metaphor just about kind of, I, we all agree with you and at the same time that concern shouldn't paralyze us into passivity for adopting interventions for good actors. The last thing I'll note, we work very closely with Thorn, which is a child uh, sexual abuse material organization that is of course really concerned that bad people who are making child abuse material that is generated are not going to put these, inter these solutions into their content. So there are other technical points of intervention too that we might think about. Of course it might not deal with the one end of the spectrum North Korean bad actor, but if there are mischief makers in between kind of a Bruce and North Korea who might be creating you know, this type of material, how do we train our models on different types of material? Or there are kind of mitigations at different stages of the pipeline of model development that might lead to more responsible outcomes, or how do you build in some of the watermarking signals at an earlier layer? We're also doing work right this second about looking at the impact of different disclosure methods like provenance, watermarking, fingerprinting, not to get really wonky. And one of the questions we ask is how easily can it be removed? And how likely is it that we could bake this in in a way that makes it hard to avoid using it? And we're interested in asking that question because if people say absolutely not, that's a threat risk that we want our cybersecurity people to be aware of and maybe pay more attention with in detection. And the last thing I will say is, hopefully you've sensed this from all of us, is we need more assessment of what's actually happening. Um, so we have the puffer pope, but what impact did that cause other than generating kind of perhaps three more degrees of skepticism on the part of people. I fell for that, I admit that all the time. Um, but what we're interested in doing and what all of the 18 institutions that have joined our framework, including TruePic, but also Thorn and uh, Meta, Microsoft, Google, the big actors, is to submit a case about how they are actually doing some of these methods. What are they, and what are they failing to do? We're really trying to get them to offer more transparency about how did the BBC label its voice you know, prompt in a way that users cared for, and if you are Microsoft, how worried are you about the fact that this intervention you're putting out is actually not gonna protect against some other instance? So it's again not a perfect solution, but I'm a big believer that we almost need to build up this body of case law for how these things are working, because if no bad actors are using deep fakery, then maybe we don't need to be that concerned right now. Not suggesting that's where we are, but we're kind of operating from this constant forecast mode without a ton of evidence about how different institutions and people are using this technology versus earlier ones to cast doubt or cause, cause geopolitical chaos. Um, we are at time. I, I wanna thank our panelists. Uh, this was a fantastic panel. Um, <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and I'm sure everyone will be around for questions afterwards. Thanks.